Vater, ich werde ihn jetzt bitte zu sagen, die Amen. As I mentioned in the 1962 calendar, uh, today is a uh, repeat of January 1st, a uh, day within the, um, um, uh, I guess within the Christmas season still, it's the, it's the um, mass from the first, January 1st, there we go. Uh, but in the United States, uh, this is a change after 1962, uh, the feast of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. So we will hear a little bit about her today. Uh, but I did want to mention that a few days ago I mentioned there was a desert, one of the desert fathers, one of the um, ascetics. He, he lived a very penitential life. He stood outside for seven days at a time, uh, wanted admi admittance to a monastery. They told him it was too tough for him. He entered and they asked him to leave because he was too tough for them. Uh, but I couldn't remember his name. Uh, that was St. Macarius the Younger uh, from 2nd January. So if you want to look up his life, it's very edifying. Uh, but Elizabeth Ann Seton, um, a lot of firsts uh, in for America here with this saint. Uh, she was the first saint, uh, canonized saint, who was uh, born in America, um, what would become the America, uh, nation of America. Well, Katiri Tekakwitha, I guess, is the first Native American saint. But she's the first, like, uh, um, uh, the one that was actually living while it was a country. So uh, she established the first Catholic girls' school in the nation, the first and the first American congregation of religious sisters. Uh, plenty of uh, religi religious orders were here already, but she actually founded one, uh, uh, I guess, from the, from the ground up. So she was born in the year 1774, a couple years before we were a nation, to a wealthy Episcopalian family, and her, her family name was Bailey. Her mother died when she was only three years old, uh, so that was, that was uh, you know, traumatizing to her, we could say, and her father remarried. And with this, her stepmother, uh, her father had five more children, and that seemed to be going well. Um, Elizabeth's stepmother took her on charitable house calls. She would go around and visit the poor and the sick and uh, be very charitable. So that was uh, left an impression on young Elizabeth. Uh, but unfortunately, this second marriage ended in divorce. And so Elizabeth's stepmother, only um, maybe a few years later, ended up um, leaving the family and rejecting Elizabeth. So now she lost her mother twice. So that was a, a rough thing for her. And, you know, kind of an um, indication that, you know, even hundreds of years ago, divorce was still a problem, we could say. And notice that these were Episcopalians who got a divorce. And they were wealthy. That was the thing back then. Poor people couldn't afford a divorce. Not that you couldn't pay the lawyers, you couldn't afford to lose your, your helpmate. No. Um, so that's a, a sad um, event in her life, uh, the second time. Uh, but at age 19, she married a man by the name of William Seaton, from whom, which she would take her name. And he was a wealthy businessman in New York. He, his family had come from Scotland, and they were businessmen uh, uh, overseas uh, uh, um, trading. And so uh, it was a very happy life for her. He was, he was a good man, uh, came from a good family. And so not only was she, was she wealthy and in high society, uh, she was a very devout Episcopalian communicant, uh, but, you know, believing in God, wanting to cooperate with the grace of her baptism. And she continued the charitable example of her mother-in-law. She visited the poor, the sick, was generous with her time, with her church, and with her friends. And so there we see that... Um, we see that, what do you call that, invincible ignorance at work. People that don't know they're in error. And so this is Elizabeth Ann Seton. Uh, she, she was worshiping God the best way that she knew how and the way that she thought was proper. Um, <clears throat> but just a few years later, um, her husband's fortunes and his health would take a turn for the worse. Um, he lost some ships at sea. England went to war with France. There was embargoes. It was just disastrous for his business. And so, um, uh, he, he, and then he started to get sick, I guess because of it. A yellow fever was raging there in New York. And so uh, it kept getting worse. The family was losing money. They were spending money on doctors. And eventually they thought if he went to Italy, the warmer climate would help his health. So he moved with, with Elizabeth, his wife, and there are five children at this point. They all moved to Italy, and when they got there, they got put in quarantine for a few months because of the yellow fever in New York. Now we know what that means, right? It's not pleasant. Um, <clears throat> so while they're in quarantine, uh, either there or shortly thereafter, her husband, uh, he died. And now she was completely devastated. Her, her, her family, they'd been impoverished. Uh, she had five children. She had no husband. What was she supposed to do? So this is a, a, the, the darkest period of her life to that point. 
Um, and this is where God steps in, right? It, it's those darkest periods where we think, God, where are you? Uh, that he, he, He's like, I brought you here for a reason. And why did he bring her to Italy? Why did she have to lose her husband? Uh, because there she met his business partners, Italian uh, businessmen, and they taught her about the Catholic faith, the true worship of God, the true sacraments, uh, communion that wasn't just a symbol of our Lord's body and blood, but actually was our Lord's body and blood. And she was completely convinced. She'd already been suspecting it for a while. And then now this is what enabled her to become Catholic. I mean, had her husband uh, continued living, I mean, as pleasant as that would have been uh, in this world, would he have agreed with that? Would he have become Catholic? Would he have let her become Catholic? Right? We don't know. So uh, in any case, uh, God's mercy uh, brought her to the Catholic faith, and she returned to uh, New York about a year later, and then she was baptized in uh, St. Peter's Church there in New York. And this is 1805. And it might be surprising. It's a little church. Um, it's kind of an ugly one. It was this like neo-Greek architecture. It looks like a pagan temple, like pillars in the front. But it was, a, it was the first Catholic, or not the first, but it was the only Catholic church in New York City in 1805. It was one Catholic church in New York City because of all the anti-Catholicism in this country. I mean, forget about that. This country was very anti-Catholic. You could have religious freedom in this country as long as you were Protestant and not Catholic. Um, you may be familiar with uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the only signer of the Declaration of Independence who was also Catholic. Um, and and this, this, the, the Carrolls, they're very wealthy in, in uh, Maryland. Uh, they, at one point, they had their fortunes seized and taken because they were Catholic. In fact, uh, uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton she herself would be baptized by Charles Carroll's um, cousin, who was John Carroll, uh, the only bishop of the United States uh, from Baltimore. So uh, she entered the Catholic Church in 1805. Uh, she was confirmed by uh, uh, Bishop Carroll, uh, Carrollton, and she opened a school for girls, for the kind of high society, upper class girls in New York, which could have done well, should have done well, but then when the, when, the, when the Protestant mothers found out that the woman running the school was Catholic, they would pull their children out of the school. Right, that's that's how, how bad it was. So she was wondering what to do. This wasn't working. It was, it was, it was failing. Uh, and then she was invited to come down to Maryland and start a girls' school by a bishop who was visiting, uh, Father Louis Dubourg. He was um, a bishop of the Louisiana Territory. He himself was from France, and Bishop Carroll had invited him in to help out run, uh, I think it was St. Mary's School in, in Maryland. Now, we've heard of this bishop before, actually, if you've listened to my sermons. Bishop Louis de Bourg. Uh, he was the one who, this is 1809, he invites Elizabeth Ann Seton, come down and start a girls' school. Uh, a few years later, in 1817, he would be in Paris, and he met a, uh, another woman who was named uh, Rose Philippine Duchesne. And he invited her to come out and to start a school also. And so she did as well. So we don't hear about uh, Bishop um, Louis de Bourg. Um, he actually got, ended up, um, uh, he was invited out of America because he was too French for the other English ecclesiastics. He went back and became a bishop in, uh, in France. Uh, but he, he invited these, these women in, right? He got Elizabeth Ann Seton to come down to Maryland. And he got Rose Philippine de Chen to come out. And she worked in uh, St. Louis um, St. Charles, Missouri, and then also in Kansas City. So uh, kind of like the behind the scenes working. He's not a saint, uh, but he worked with them, and he, he got them started in their paths. So that's a very interesting bit of history there, Bishop Louis de Bourg. So um, Elizabeth Ann Seton um, goes down to Maryland, and she starts this school. She calls it the St. Joseph's Academy and Free School. It was the first free school in the United States, and it's still in operation. It's still there. You can, go, you can attend there. You can send your kids there. Um, and it marked, actually, this is the beginning, and nobody knew it at the time, this is the beginning of the Catholic parochial school system in the United States. Uh, it would become just all over the place. Thousands and thousands and thousands of schools. Staffed by nuns, right? By women, women just like uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton and Rose Philippine Duchenne, who we just heard about. Uh, so she established now, so who's going to teach at the school, right? You get other generous souls just like herself. Uh, a couple of her daughters join her, uh, some young women join her, and so she starts a religious community. And she models it after the Sisters of Charity uh, from St. Vincent de Paul. And this would become the first congregation of religious sisters founded in the United States. First free school, first congregation. And on March 25th in 1809, Elizabeth Ann Seton pronounced her vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. 
And from then on, she was called Mother Seton. And for the rest of her life, she would spend uh, taking care of these schools and her newfound congregation. And she was described as a charming and cultured lady, of course, from her upbringing. And um, that, that greatly assists in the establishment of, of communities and endeavors just such as this. Somebody who, who understands um, high society and, and politeness and manners and courtesy, um, that, isn't, that isn't for show, that isn't to impress other people. It, it's to, um, well, it is, it's to impress other people with, uh, with kindness, with actual charity, with love of God. That's what that's for. Um, in fact, um, I think I've mentioned this before, but, but high society and all these like, um, we think of this, this snooty French aristocracy or whatever, that's the perversion of um, the medieval aristocracy, which was all about charity, which is about uh, uh, serving others, it was about being uh, Christ-like to others and treating others as Christ. That's where high society came from. Uh, so she understands this and it's, it's very helpful to her in founding her new community. And, um, you know, her connections with New York High Society caused some social pressure. She had been pressured to leave that. That wasn't proper. That wasn't, um, you know, fitting in, whatever it may be. Uh, but she left a deep impact, right? Similar to um, St. Catherine Drexel. Her feast day is coming up, too. Very rich, very high society um, uh, American uh, woman who joined the church. Um, and so she continued on with this, and eventually she herself, you know, she would suffer through um, the death of two of her daughters would die. It's a hard thing. And they, were, they weren't young. They were like 17 and 15, and two of her daughters died. One of the young sisters in her community died. There were misunderstandings, conflicts. Uh, but she continued working, and she, she uh, ended up, as I said, founding those school systems. And she died um, in 1821 at the age of 46, not very old at all. And that was 1821. That's 199 years ago today was uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton died. And this is kind of a, I don't know, um, interesting for me because I went to Seton Homeschool Program named after her. And that was an experience. Uh, but now I know a little bit more about whom, about, uh, whom it was named after, uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton herself. And she's got some great uh, quotes uh, about prayer. Prayer is what enabled her to accomplish what she did. Uh, we must pray without ceasing in every occurrence and employment of our lives. That prayer, which is rather a habit of lifting up the heart to God, as in a constant communication with him, that practicing the presence of God, praying always, as St. Paul says. Secondly, uh, the first end I propose in our daily work is to do the will of God. Secondly, to do it in the manner he wills it. And thirdly, to do it because it is his will. Now, those three things are so, so important. Do what you're supposed to do. Uh, do it charitably. And do it even if you don't want to, right? That's do it because God wills it. Not because I'm going to be successful, not because it's going to work, not because I like it. I'm doing it because this is what God wants me to do, right? That's the best way to do things. Uh, so, you know, what, what, a, what a difference. What a difference one woman can make, right, who simply corresponds with God's plan for her life. And as I say all the time, right, it's not up to us. She didn't choose to do that. Uh, the, the, the bishop came and invited her down. That's why it happened. Right? So often in life, that's how these great things for God are accomplished, not through us going out and forging a path and I'm going to make a name for myself in the church or uh, you know, I'm going to do, do something great for the church. I mean, that's great. Those are good, those are good desires. Uh, but God is the one who actually makes it happen. Just wait and be patient. Uh, and, and God, will, God will, will see that we do our things. So right, we're like, we're like um, really, we should consider ourselves bench warmers in the spiritual life, right? In the church, we're bench warmers. Uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit on the bench until I get called into the game by the divine coach, right? And until then, I, do, I go to scrimmage, I do my practice, I run up and down, I do all the drills, and then if I get called in, I go and I'm ready. And that's, 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 that's all the saints. Elizabeth Ann Seton is no different. I mean, how many times have we heard about saints who they just, they were, they were good people, they lived their lives, they did their prayers, disaster happened, they didn't despair, they didn't give up, they just kept going, they kept persevering, and then you know, these incredible things happen. Right? That is how God likes to work. Uh, so, you know, we all, and we all want to see, we want to see something amazing happening in the U.S. We want to see this country turn around, and politics, and the church, and whatever. Uh, be patient. I mean, who knows how it's going to happen or when it's going to happen, or maybe it's already started. Maybe somebody a year ago has started something that's going to come to fruition and be like, oh, there it was, but we didn't know about it. And that's why I like, had indigestion for three and a half years, just because I was worrying so much about something that was already underway. So don't worry about it. Right? Be at peace. And thank God for sending his saints, and thank God for sending uh, converts. She was a convert, not even a cradle Catholic. She was an Episcopalian. 
up until she was in her 20s. Uh, but that is what God likes to do. He, he, he calls, he called the Jews, he calls the Gentiles, right, in the Old Testament. And so now, right, he, he, he calls those who have a generous heart. So let's pray for uh, uh, not just ourselves and our families, but for converts, right? Pray that God will bring those, those good men and women into the church and build upon the natural virtues, right? Build upon their uh, um, generosity responding to the grace of baptism. Uh, so let's pray for that uh, through the intercession of Elizabeth Ann Seton. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.